Good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, we'll be going to the book of Luke, the ninth chapter this morning for this morning's message. I would like to uh, echo something that was said earlier, and that is I would love to be able to see the kids up here singing specials. Uh, my wife, by the way, has told me that I've been singing a special all along. My words are different than the words that are on the board. Uh, and so she says I sound good, though. Uh, what, one of the things that I thought was very remarkable is, okay, she messed up on a song, and now it's, she's calling it a Jeff. She said, I did a Jeff. So how did it become my thing? How did I own it? I don't know. Uh, before we actually get into our message this morning, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence this morning with gratitude upon our hearts for the day that you have provided for each and every one of us. Father, we th are thankful that we have this place to come to, to be able to worship you and to sing songs of praise into your name. And Father, to be able to learn more about you and from you. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would guide us today through your word to the place that you would have us to be, that we might clearly know that we have been in your presence today. Father, I pray also that if there be one, whether it be online or be here, who has never uh, come to a place of accepting Jesus as their personal Savior, that today your Spirit, through your word, might convict them of their, their great need. So, Heavenly Father, that they might, uh, along with us, be able to worship you in, in, in spirit and in truth. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to be able to send our messages out over uh, online, because, Father, it, all we want to do is to get your word out to the people who might be able to hear it. So give us the grace, give us the strength, help us that we might continue doing the things in which you would have us do, and that we might, with, with a full heart, be able to glorify and exalt your holy name. May Jesus be, be exalted today in all the things that we say and do. These things we pray in his name. Amen. Counting the cost. I was thinking as we were going through the lesson this morning, what is the great thing that a teacher wants to do? Teach. But the end result is, is, is what we look for. We want, we want to teach in order that our students might learn and that they might come to a clear knowledge of Jesus in their life. Right? We, we, want, we don't just teach to be able to hear ourselves speak, though there might be people who do that. But that's not one of our goals. That's not one of the things in which we are striving to do. We're not doing it for prestige, you know, to be honored and, and, and elevated ourselves. Why is it that teachers teach? So that their students might be lifted up through, through knowledge. Jesus, as I was looking at these scriptures throughout the week, Jesus taught what it, what it means to count the cost before following after him. And, it, and I thought to myself, you know, he could have clearly said what he said in a very easy manner and got his word across to them with very simple things, you know, such as uh, that God is to be honored above all, to say that, right? That God is to be, to be treated as our sole source of, of knowledge, that we are to follow after him and no other. But Jesus gave examples, I think, that we might be able to understand what it is that it means to follow after him. There are three examples that are given, and so we'll talk about all three of them. But I, what I really wanted you to understand before we actually get into this is that the messages in which he gives unto them shows unto us really three different uh, facets of what it means to really be a follower of Jesus. Not, not that there, aren't more, there isn't more to it, but these three are enough for us to understand the, the importance of letting everything else go so that we might clearly be able to follow him in, in the way in which he desires for us to. You see, our, our um, following after certain things usually becomes hot and cold. It's, it's usually we're, we're all on fire for something for a while, and, and there's nothing that is going to get in our way. And then there are times when we become to a lull and we say to ourselves, boy, I don't know if I just really feel up to it today. And so easily things begin to creep in and easily things begin to 
uh, stop us from doing what it is that we need to be doing and following in the pathway that we're supposed to follow. But Jesus, as he gives this to, to them, he gives it to them, I think, in a, in a manner which basically says, prior to entering into the, to the place of following after me, consider these things so that you might understand the things that you might come up against and the things which will help you along the way. And so Luke 9, verse 57, it says, And it came to pass <clears throat> that as they went in their way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my, my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but, let, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid farewell, which are at my home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In the book of Matthew, it says the very first one that we look at, that where it says, that, and a certain man, it says, and a certain scribe. So what we might would be able to understand about the scribe in himself is that he was a teacher of the people, but he found something very unique in Jesus, whether it been the messages in which he had taught, or whether it been the fact that he was able to heal those that were brought to him for that very purpose. That, that the scribe himself might have seen in Jesus a way to, to step out of the norm and more into a place that that he longed to be, right? To be a scribe above all other scribes. To be able to maybe do the things in which Jesus did and, and then be able to wow the people because of his ability to, to, to heal or whatever the miracles might be that he would do. Either way, this scribe had seen something in Jesus that made him want to follow after him. And so he says, I, I will follow you wherever you go. But one of the things that we see here is that what Jesus uses in response to his willingness or his desire to follow him is that Jesus tells him it's not going to be that easy. He says unto them that, that the foxes have holes in which to, to sleep, and so do the birds have the trees, but the Son of Man has nothing. In other words, even though you might see something in me that, that you desire to have for your own self, it's, you won't, you don't, what you don't see might be a hindrance to you, and that is I have nowhere to lay my own head. And it, it's interesting on this viewpoint, you know, you've already heard, as Jesse has said, and also as Scott had, had repeated, and that is if you see uh, a creation, then you realize that there must be a creator, that, that Jesus was the creator, and he stood right before them, that Jesus was a stranger in his own world, the world that he created. He was a stranger, a wanderer, an outcast. And this is the message that he's telling the scribe. That even though you see something in me that you might desire, understand, I have nowhere to even lay my head. I call, there's no place I can call home. He came unto his own, John the first chapter, verse 11. And what? His own received him not. That he was a man with, without a home. <laughs> Imagine that, the creator of all things. Not even a home. Not a place to lay his head. It, it kind of makes you think for a second what, what about the things that you have, doesn't it? I mean, we may not have a lot as far as the world sees things. But how do we, what do we possess in 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 view of what Jesus had while he was here upon earth. There was a moment in time where John and some of his disciples were conversing with Jesus, then, but then Jesus moved on. And the question became, where dwellest thou? 
The 31st verse of the uh, first chapter of John, it says, And in the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? And And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to be which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came, and they saw where he dwelt, and abode with with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And asking where he dwelt, it 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 shows that that they wanted to be more acquainted themselves with Jesus. Where dwellest thou? They had been John's disciples. But as Jesus passes on or passes by, they began to follow him. And the question that Jesus asked them is, what are you seeking? And they said, where do you dwell? Where do you live? See, not knowing this, what one would... uh, gather from this, seeing that Jesus himself is asking the question and they are responding to the question that he asked and that Jesus himself had no place to call home, that as he would lead them on, that what what they were really saying to him was, where where is the inn in which you are dwelling in? Right? Where where is the place that you yourself call home? Where is it that you dwell? And so Jesus led them. And what I think we can gather are are two things, because what they wanted was more. They they had talked, they had heard John, they had watched John, they had been with John, and as Jesus is passing by, John says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And as he continues to walk, they follow after him, but they're really looking more for, to to understand more about him. And there's two ways. One is, is a further communion with him, which basically says just wanting to know more about it. You know, more than you can get that than if Jesus were just passing by and Jesus said a few words to them. More than that. So where do you dwell? Where is your home? Where is the place that you lay your head? The second thing is maybe more of a fixed communion with Jesus. One in which they could sit at his feet and they can learn more out from him by him. That 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 he could teach them more than what they already knew and they could be in a place where he would be themselves. I think when you get down to it is you can't let you can't let the things that you see with your eyes that might be a a discouragement to some you cannot let those things be a discouragement to you there is no real prestige in all of this there, there is no self-glory. There is no fancy. You know, there, there are some that are, right? There are some who, who have idols, have, I said idols, but have statues, if you will, in their, their places, say in their foyer or foyer, whichever you feel like. And, and they're made of gold and they're, they're shiny. They have, have jewels on them and, and they're, they're, they're lovely. You know, they, there are those that, that, you know, they pay. Don't get me wrong, Kenny. We, we'll pay you if you want. But they get paid to lead in the songs and the services and such like that. We pay our teachers. We, 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 we find the best of everything that we can. And that's what, what we show unto everybody else. That wasn't Jesus. You see that what I'm saying? That wasn't Jesus. And to be a to be a true follower of something or someone is more than just words. It's action. See, I, I, 
we can learn, but there, there are sometimes where actions get in the way of us being able to learn fully what it is that we want to understand, what we need to understand. That actions really speak louder than words. And so as Jesus is walking by and they're asking, where do you dwell? He's saying, come and see, because if you want the real test, now here's my home. My home is the ground that we stand upon. My home is here in the air that we breathe. This is my home. I have no fancy housing for myself, and those that follow me or follow with me will have the same. Because this world is not our home. We have, a, we have a heavenly dwelling place where those who truly commune with God are elevated to be able to be in that place even today. Our home is not of this world. Another disciple would say unto him, I will follow thee, but suffer me first that I might go and bury my father, who obviously had, had passed. And Jesus would say unto him, but let the dead bury the dead. It's one of the, one of the things that sometimes we look at and we actually say, wow, that's tough. Right? Could you imagine that your mother or your father had passed away and all you were requiring of, of the Lord was, was that you could go and attend to the, the, the business of burying your loved one. And he would say unto you flat out, no, if you'll be a follower of me, you, you'll, you'll let that one go and you'll come follow me. Let the be dead bury their own. That would be tough, wouldn't it? It'd be one of those things that'd be hard for us to be able to grasp. Maybe something we could not do. We could not accomplish that very task of letting that go by the wayside and continuing to follow. But if you really get down to the nitty gritty of what it is that Jesus is really trying to show unto them, it is this, that the first duty of man is religion. Now, religion on this part, understand what I'm saying, because everything that Brother Scott said about religion this morning is absolutely true. But as Matthew Henry is trying to help us to understand, it is the attendance to those things that are of God. That is our first obligation. Suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus is saying unto him, suffer that first that you might follow after me. It becomes a hard teaching. And some might would say, because we're, we're of that sort sometimes, some might would say, but isn't, isn't burying our dead, isn't you know, getting together with, with, with our people, you know, our friends, our family, uh, our acquaintances, or, or even more to, to the, the point, the acquaintance of the one who has passed on, isn't, isn't that a grand opportunity to be able to share the gospel with the people who, who are open? You know, their hearts have been rended, and they're ready to, to hear. But one of the things in which maybe we haven't really taken into consideration is is that in reality, those who are, are attending a funeral are not in a position to be ready to hear the gospel. They're not. It may seem like that would be the case, but it's not. It's, it's usually those people. I mean, real, reality says this, and because I've been doing it for a long time now, when I, when I start to teach about heaven and hell at a funeral service, there are usually people to get up and walk out. Because basically what they're saying to you is, I don't want to hear that. I'm here to, to pay my respects to the one who has passed on. They're not, they're not in a position of feeling guilt for the sin that is in their life. They're there to mourn the passing of someone whom they love. Because death and hell have... have that people don't think about that much anymore, you know? And I, 
I might would echo your sentiments, and I might would say to, to you just as well as you, you as as you feel about it that it, it's it's our opportunity, and maybe these people will never be in a place where they can hear about it again, and that's true. But what Jesus is saying is there's there's two different things here. Let the dead bury their dead. Let them who attend unto one another in this, this way, let them take care of that. Go ye and, and preach the kingdom of God. That he, he tells them to, to, to go beyond themselves and teach the things that need to be taught to a people who, who lie at death's door themselves. with the arrangements for the funerals and, and, and the preparations that they would have to be made for, for the mourners and which would be called to the task and for everything that, that, that surrounds. You know, you know who gets... And just, just bear with me for a second. I'm not, I'm not really trying to... It's not a, a sticky point with me. But you know who gets more respect at a funeral? The people who bring the food. <laughs> the preacher is not is not cared for anymore. It's like he's a he's a byproduct of everything else. If he could just stand up there for a few minutes and make sure this thing is running according to order, then we'll be happy with the preacher. But the preacher needs to stop preaching because we're ready to get to the food. The people who prepare the food are the people who are more uh, honored at a funeral these days. That's just the truth. It's, it's just a fact. So Jesus says there's something I want you to attend to that is more important. And that is to preach the kingdom of God. It is our responsibility to preach to those who are still in need the ways to heaven. Let the dead bury the dead. So another one comes up to Jesus, this last one. He says unto him, he says, bid, uh, give me an opportunity to bid farewell to those that are at my home, whether it be my father, whether it be my mother, whether it be uh, my brothers, my sisters, whoever it might be. Let me go home first and let me say goodbye. You know, and, and so Jesus says unto, unto him that no man has put his hand to the plow and looks back is worthy of the kingdom of heaven. The point being is that there is no way that we are ever going to, to plow a straight row if we're constantly looking backwards. It is, it is our, our time to, to begin to move forward in our, our service to God. This is our responsibility. The purpose to every Christian requires what? A decision. Just a plain decision. Will you be a follower of Christ or not? You decide. Will you, will you give up all other things that you might be able to clearly follow after Jesus? It's your decision. We're, nobody is going to drag you uh, down to this altar and force you to accept the things in which, which we want you to accept. We're just going to simply offer you an opportunity. Jesus doesn't force you. He doesn't say that you will follow me. He says, if you will follow me. And the, the point that he's making with this guy is he's not telling him, you know, I, you can't go back. He's saying, but if you were to follow me, you will not look back. You will put your hands to the plow and you will follow after me. Joshua 24, verse 14, Joshua said unto the people, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And what's interesting to me, and I've never really kind of dealt, you know, dove into it, but think about what Joshua says to them. He takes them back before the flood, that he says, your fathers before the flood served these idols. And, and then they brought that same ideology, that same kind of service into their, their, their servitude when they came into Egypt. He says, now it's your opportunity. It's your time to decide who will you follow? 
It's your choice. It's nobody else's. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether uh, the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whom's land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, my decision is we will serve the Lord. We will not serve anything else. We will not put th- something else in, in our way. We will, we will not serve ourselves. We will, not ser- we will serve the Lord. That's a decision. That's what has to happen for each and every one of us. A decision has to be made. God is to be obeyed rather than men. It is Him who we serve. It is Him who we follow. To put one's hand to the plow is, is about any, other, any business that a person could, could involve himself in. And it talk, what it simply is talking about is <clears throat> whether a person is moving forward or a person is looking backward. Because nobody who looks back with fond desires of, of saying, if I'd only, if I'd only, if I'd only, that I could have had all this. You know, I, I, I remember when I first was called into the ministry, I thought I had a pretty, pretty good job. I mean, I, it was menial labor. I was a custodian, but I was a custodian for the county you know, the San Bernardino County, and I was young. So bottom line is I could have grown, I could have elevated up in this, this place because I, I had started at a young age and I could, man, what could have I been? I, even while I worked there, I owned cars and I owned three cars. You still one behind me. I owned three cars. They all ran too. One was a Dodge. I'm just, I thought I had it all made. But then the Lord called me into the ministry. I had to sell all three of those cars and buy another car, which was a, a little blue Celica, which, by the way, I, I put fur in the dashboard and fur on the doors. I thought I was, I was hummed in. I called in the ministry, but I still had that, I still had that right? I still had the, the... And so looking back... We look back. I can I can say, man, if I hadn't been called in ministry, I had this sweet ride. Where could that sweet ride have taken me? That's what he's talking about, though. He's talking about the fact that a person who follows after him, but yet continues to, in their mind and in their heart, be back here. They're not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. It takes a decision because it takes the whole person to truly follow after the Lord. It cannot be in part. It has to be all. It has to be the entire person because isn't that really what God deserves? Not just part of us, but all of us. And if we can't give him our all, then are we truly giving him anything at all? Paul told Agrippa in Acts 26 chapter, he says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But Paul said, I would not, I would to God, that not only thou, but all, also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together such as I am, except in these bonds. And it takes me back to Acts the 11th chapter, just to kind of put it into perspective. In the 11th chapter, verse 25, it says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first and Antioch. To Agrippa, he, Agrippa would say, almost you persuaded me to become a Christian. But it was Paul's life that kind of dictated this thing because as, as Barnabas found Paul, they went down to Antioch. And by the time they were done in Antioch, they were, they were the first ones to be called Christians right there. 
In other words, what I say to you is this, that that didn't come without, without effort. That came because he gave his all. He gave his all to Jesus and then became identified as a Jesus follower. Not by other Jesus followers, but by those who condemned Jesus followers. They were called Christians first in Antioch. In closing, Matthew Henry said this. He says, He that is not willing to sacrifice everything for the cause of God is really willing to sacrifice nothing. And that is the truth. I was thinking, Jesus had said, he'd kind of put it to, the, to those who are following him already in John the 15th chapter. He said, no greater love. And if we just stop there and let our minds kind of roll for a second and say, let's finish this, sentence, this statement, no greater love. What does that mean to you? How, how, would, you, how, would, you, how would you explain what is no greater love? Is it the love that you have for your kids? Is it the love that you have for your, your spouse? The love that you have for your job or, or maybe the love that you had for your money, which we, we were informed earlier and I believe it, it to be true because the Bible says it, that there, the root of all evil is the love of money. But there are people who follow after fame and fortune all the time. So how would you explain the, the idea of what no greater love means? Jesus simply said that a man laid down his life for his friends. That Jesus gave his life for you and for me. That we might have life in him. He gave his life that we might have life. No greater love at any man than this. To be a follower of Jesus means to be identified with him. How great is your love? If your love is what it, what it is supposed to be, then Jesus is first in your life. And everything else will answer to that. How great is your love? Let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer. to the Lord.